Well, good morning again. I'm glad you all are here. We're continuing on in our sermon series on wilderness. Today we're going to be talking about fasting, but I want to make sure you all know about something that's going on today in this space right afterwards. Bishop Carter, Bishop Ken Carter, who used to uh, serve this church here, I think from 2008 to 2011, he is now the president of the Council of Bishops. He's going to be doing a question and answer time right here at 1230. So if you all do have a moment, um, he's going to be just taking questions in general, um, probably a lot about the way forward too, because he's been a leader in that. But if you'd like to hear more about that, please do stick around. Um, Or if you get a chance, if you don't have time to do that, his sermon this morning was incredibly moving. Um, It was a really, really powerful worship service this morning in the traditional worship. Um, So please take a peek at that after this. I know that's what you're going to do is run home and watch another sermon. But if you do get a chance, take a peek at the sermon. It's really, it's it's moving and it's worth it. All right, I'm going to try to catch my breath because this thing is like 65 pounds. So I've been trying to act like I'm not tired from lifting that up, but... uh, All right, got my composure back. So we're talking about wilderness today, which I said last week, it's an invitation into the wilderness, which is not what we always think. It's trying to go beyond what your normal routine is. We're taking on these different practices. Hopefully you've um, checked out netwilderness.com, this amazing website that's got kind of some practical tools. It's a sort sur- of thrival kit, uh, as Anna's been calling it. I love that. This way of uh, try on this practice, try on these, this practice to see how you may go deeper into your faith with God. I said last week, and I'm not sure I just love this quote, but it's been stirring in me. I said, if, if we can do everything that's on our our plate by ourselves. Maybe we aren't going to where God is calling us. I do believe that God calls us beyond complacency, that God calls us into challenging times sometimes to grow in our faith. So I, I pray that you'll try on one of these practices to deeply root ourselves to God. And from this deep-rooted place, we really find God. You know, part of what Lent is, is a season of being serious about our repentance. Uh, The word, and the Greek word for repent literally means to turn, as I shared last week. So uh, we turn from our own ways. And as Isaiah 55 tells us, we trust that God's ways aren't our ways. That maybe we need to try something a little bit different. Like today, we're going to be talking about fasting, which for most people as a spiritual practice, this is not something you would normally do, just not eat, Right? Um, But perhaps you should give it a try and see where God might find you in these wilderness places. So fasting is just that, going without food or drink. But during Lent, we think about it kind of even more broadly. Sometimes you give up other things. Maybe you give up coffee in in general. I know there's some folks who that was a struggle bus for some people at the beginning of of the Lenten series, uh, a season. Some people give up social media. That's why I haven't liked any of your cat and dog pictures or anything like that. That's what I'm doing this. Uh, There's lots of different things. You pray about it and, and see what you might give up in order to take something else on. So that time I'm not using in social media, right? Uh, My screen time, you know how now your iPhones and stuff send you a screen time at the end of every week, which is kind of like shocking. Uh, Now that's that's gone way down, and hopefully that time has been better used to pray and read or and go be with family, whatever you might do. There's lots of different things you can fast from. I really like this idea, and I hope to pick it up after Lent. Uh, There's an eco-justice fast. There's a group of people all over the world that one day a week, for the rest of their lives, they plan on it, in order to take better care of our creation, they fast from using any sort of plastic, any sort of non-reusable plastic. And, and there's lots and lots of different ways that you can choose to fast. So I encourage you uh, to try that. That's what today is really about. We're going to talk about fasting, but why? Right? That, that's what I ultimately end on in all of these sermons. Why in the world am I talking about this? Why do you sit here and listen for 25 to 30 minutes? Why does this matter to our lives? And I was thinking about the why and praying through it because I felt really led to this topic months ago. Why are we talking about fasting today? Why are we talking about these spiritual practices at all? And it started hitting me, this idea of us being thirsty people, that we are needy, needy people. We're thirsty people desperate for the drink of answers, of presence. We have parched souls and minds that just have to get a drop of God's living water in our lives. I think we want to know what's going on in our lives. That's a normal thing, and we turn to God for that. We live in an age where facts are easy to find. As I've shared in here before, I love doing that. Google uh, Google is just amazing. It's how you write every single sermon, right? Google reports that over 40,000 searches are logged per second. Every second, there's 40,000 individual searches going on. That's more than 3.5 billion per day. 
And this creates a problem, even though it's really convenient having that, you know? Like, who is Seth Avent married to, right? Like, I Googled that, and well, you Google all these things, it's nice to know. It creates a problem for our thirsty souls. Our souls need to drink, too. Our souls need answers, too, and you can't Google the answers to your souls, to what we really are needing, what we're really craving, what we're trying to pay attention to, our spirit life during the season of Lent. But you may know the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. He tells her there that the water God wants to give us, this thirst that we have, while physical water is good, we'll get thirsty again. If you drink from Jesus as well, you'll never get thirsty again, he says. I like this idea of thirst for us. I think it's uh, apropos while we're here in the middle of the wilderness. M. Craig Barnes, he talks about thirst this way. He says, we keep presenting Jesus as a what before we introduce him as a who. Knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing him. This has the effect of turning the word, the word Christian into an adjective, which is something the Bible never does, he says. If we are not, I love this line, if we are not astonished by Jesus, we are following something other than the person described in the Bible. Fasting, meditation, whatever practice you choose to take on or you choose to try during this Lenten season, it's not a Google search or an exploration, explanation of a why or a what. Instead, we're talking about fasting today. We're taking these spiritual disciplines to learn about the who, to learn about connecting to God, to slow ourselves down, to quiet ourselves down, to remove any of the stuff that's getting in the way in our lives and really get to know Christ God in a more, por- more personal way that means something for our lives here and now today. T- fasting throughout the ages, I could have I thought about quoting all these uh, scholars, all the kind of uh, p- uh, patristic fathers, right? There's all these great, uh, if you go to seminary or if you do any sort of Bible research kind of thing, you have to learn about the fathers that sort of help develop Christianity. So I thought about quote, quote, quoting Tertullian and Augustine and then all those kind of people to you but just trust me. Go on Google and you can look for yourself. They all tried fasting. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist faith, he said it's one of the most uh, underappreciated practices in the Christian faith. He practiced it at least twice a week, if not three times a week. Fasting is a tried and true way of people trying to find an intimate relationship with God. Not just knowing stuff about God, but fasting was a way that they got themselves in the room with God. They got themselves face to face with God. And there's scripture from the Bible uh, that obviously talks about fasting as well. Today it's from the book of Ezra, not a very popular book, I can tell you, because I didn't have a bookmark beforehand. I'm sitting over there during the song. I'm like, where is Ezra? I thought it was after Judges, but it's not, by the way. You've got to keep going a little bit farther. Um, But Ezra, right before Nehemiah, uh, was one of the chief priests, one of the spiritual leaders of Israel. Ezra was one of the chief priests, one of the spiritual leaders of Israel in a time where they had been, a lot of them had been exiled. They had been kicked out of their land, not the big one, but this is another time where they had been kicked out of the land. And in this exile, while they're not where they normally worship, had been like us moving way, way away, not by our choice. In this time, they stopped worshiping God like God had asked them to. The covenant relationship they had with God was beginning to wane, and Ezra kind of steps in and tries to, uh, tries to bring them back to God. So what we're going to read today is from Ezra chapter 8, and Ezra meets up with this group of people, this exile who is not, aren't really following God, and Ezra convinces them and convicts them to go back into a relationship with God and, and also works with the king at that time, King Darius, who is going to let them go back to Jerusalem. Ezra is about to take this group of exiles and move them back into Jerusalem. Our scripture is from chapter 8, verses 21 through 23. This is right before their trip. Ezra says, Then I called for a fast there at the Ahava River so that we might submit before our God and ask of him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our possessions. (laughs) This is a funny verse to me. I had been ashamed to ask the king for a group of soldiers and cavalry to help us facing enemies on the way because we had told the king the power of God favors all who seek him, but his fierce wrath is against all who abandon him. So we fasted and prayed to our God for this, and he responded to us. I realize I forgot to pray as we start, and that's a bad thing. Would you pray with me now? 
Oh God, I am grateful for the discipline of reading scripture. Somehow it always turns us back to you, convicts me even to pray. God, we ask that you would be here with us now, continue to be here with us. As we look at this specific discipline of fasting, open us up to this possibility as how you might choose to meet us, how you might choose to comfort us and heal us and bring us face to face with the who, not a what or why. God, be here now. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. God, our rock and our redeemer and everyone said... So right before one of the most dangerous trips that they were ever going to take, a trip that would be full of roving bandits and people coming, and and there there are these traveling warlords that would go around and just steal from anyone, just overpower them and take their people, take their possessions, anything they had. They could have lost their life just trying to get back to Jerusalem. This was a perilous trip across the desert. Ezra, kind of ashamed, it said, which is sort of a funny motivation, saying, okay, i got to prove that God is real on the one hand. I'm a little bit embarrassed to ask the king for protection, even though the king was starting to get on Ezra's side. Ezra, before all of this, the thing that Ezra decides is going to help them get to a place where they might find God is fasting. Ezra prioritized fasting as the thing that may be the very salvation of their life, fasting before they went on this trip. More than just a prayer of fast, they spent the day in prayer and gave up food as a way of acknowledging that they are needy people. In fasting, I love this idea, it's where we literally empty ourselves. You get hungry, right? You're, you're giving up food or maybe a drink of some sort. You're, you're giving up something to acknowledge that we have needs because we are human. And chief among those needs is our relationship with God, our connection to God. We empty ourselves just as Christ did. Philippians tells us that Christ emptied himself for us so that we might know salvation. Christ showed his need too for us. It's a strange thing, but when we take time to practice this, often overlooked practice, there's some sort of connection that we find. We're acknowledging that we're literally in need and that we need God most of all. You know, the United Methodist Church, I uh, encourage you, I'm not going to spend too much time going into each of these four points, but they kind of give, these are the four historic reasons why we might try to fast. The first one, they said, Jesus did it, and so we should do it too. That's a pretty solid argument right there. If you're a Christian, right, that's, that's pretty good. Jesus did it, so I'm going to do it too. Um, If we're aiming to be disciples of Christ, we follow Jesus' example, which is kind of part of the motivation for Lent. Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days and didn't eat or drink during that time. So here we are in this 40-day journey of Lent where we don't eat or drink different ways, of course, spiritually speaking. The second reason is fasting reminds us, as I just said, of our dependence on God. Whenever, sometimes when life is really good, whenever we don't have a whole lot of needs, if things are just going great, just got promotion, kids are doing awesome, everything is just fantastic, we can sometimes forget that we need God. So fasting reminds us that we have real needs. And again, chief among them is our spiritual need for God. The third thing they say is that fasting can be a way of entering into solidarity with the poor and the hungry. Again, sometimes it's easy for us to forget, or it's easy for us to remember that there are people who are fasting not by choice, right? Matthew 25, verse 35 says, when I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. When you do for the least of these, you've done for me. So some people take a regularly weekly fast to remember that there are people who are in need, identify with those who Christ identified himself with, calling himself the poor and the needy and the hungry. We should take times too to identify with them, to see that they need, so that we might intentionally look to hold them in prayer and then hopefully be moved to do something for service. And then the fourth one I think is what people often think about most whenever we enter into Lent. Skipping a meal might give you intentional time with God. I don't like this practice. I'm going to be honest with you all. It's a hard one for me. I am very food motivated, right? I'm a very nice person. I can be pretty generous most of the time. But if I have like a nice snack in the car and we're going on a road trip, girl, you better not touch my food, right? Like I know I have the exact number of chips in this bag that I want. You may not have any. And then I always share, right? But there's a little hostility there. Like, bring your own snack, man, right? I am very food motivated. So this one, this practice is a really hard practice for me. 
I usually will try to do it in the morning. And y'all, I wake up like craving like five eggs with cheese and soy sausage and, you know, like yogurt and granola. I mean, I'm ready to go, right? First thing in the morning. This is a hard practice and it may be for you too. But taking away that time or giving yourself that extra time where you might have been going to a restaurant, where you might have been preparing, taking that intentional time that's carved out as a break in your day to get fed, to get filled up. You're doing the same thing. You're getting fed. You're getting filled up whenever you take that time away to really lean into God. It will be hard, (laughs) especially if you're extremely food motivated. It will be hard. But it's another way that as we talk about repentance and Lent, we turn away from our ways and try something different. We turn away from a meal or two or something else to see where God might be leading us. You know, I think I was so convicted by this sermon series because it's so easy to talk about God, even in a place like this, that craves relationship, right? The net and providence, it thrives on these relationships. Sometimes we forget that really is all that we're called to do with God. That's what these disciplines are. I know these, I, I've shared this before with kind of the net team, the group of leaders who help make all of this possible, that I've really struggled with writing these sermons. In my mind, they're really bad sermons so far, right? Because it's just, I keep on being like, this is what it is. This is how it's in the Bible. Try it, try it, try it. No, really, try it, try it, try it. But the reason why I care so much about that is because I want to see our lives, your life, my life changed. What would it really look like If you fasted tomorrow or sometime this week, and during that time, you felt God like you've never felt God before, what would it be like if you really got quiet this week, took some time meditating, and you heard God call your name? What would it be like if you're waiting for a new job, you're waiting for healing, and this is the place where God found you? That's why we take time in in this season is to really humble ourselves, acknowledge that we need God, see that this is the way that other people have entered into those relationships. It's hard for me to convince you, I think. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm trying to encourage, I suppose, but it's hard to even encourage that you should try these things. Really, you do just have to try it for yourself and see where God's going to show up in them. And y'all, I should have said this is the band. You guys can start coming up. I should have said this last week, and I didn't. I should have said it from the very beginning. One of the things that bothers me about this series is that (laughs) we act like there's a right and a wrong way to do all of it. Like there's a right way to fast, like there's a right way to meditate. And there are good tried and true practices. But if you go and try to meditate this week, if you try to fast and it doesn't go exactly right, or you get really hungry, you were trying not to eat until lunch, and it's like 1045, and you start nibbling a little bit, it's okay. There's grace. The whole point of whatever practice you end up taking on absolutely needs to come from a a place, a position, a posture of, God, I need you. God, I want you in my life more than I've ever wanted anything. That's hard to say, right? Can you really say that, God? I want you right now in my life more than I want anything else in my life. That's a really hard thing to actually believe and live out. Because we have relationships that are good and that matter. We have things that are fun, jobs that sustain us and fill us, families that are important to us. And maybe that's part of how God comes to you through those relationships, through those things that God's calling you to. But this season just for a few weeks. See what it might be like to prioritize God above everything else. Know that it's going to be really hard, that some days you're going to do it really well, other days not so well, and God's grace finds us in the middle of that. And know that you don't, as this series started out with, with Nina Win, you don't do it alone. You've got me, I love you, and I'm right here. I pray for you every day. 
more than me. You've got a whole community here. I know there's a group of prayer warriors, as, as people often talk about. There's a group of people here who love you and care for you and want the best for you and want to walk side by side. Stephen ministers who want to take care of you, who want to hear you and listen to you. We're ending today by singing a song, proclaiming our need. That's how all of these practices start by humbling yourself and really believing, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you all the time. Don't we need God? When you get to that place, I think that's why God invites us out into the wilderness. Quiet down. Acknowledge that we're human and broken and craving. We're thirsty people. I hope as you walk into the wilderness, I hope it's not so hard, but when it is, I hope you feel God like you've never felt God before. I hope when you mess up, you hold yourself with some grace. I hope you don't try to walk into the wilderness all by yourself because there's a community here that wants to go with you. Oh God, we need you. Forgive us, God, for how rarely we are honest about our need with you. And just like that, you forgive us. Just like that, you call us precious. Just like that, you offer us the water that doesn't come from any well on earth. It's the living water that quenches every thirst. So Lord, meet us in this wilderness place. We give you thanks and praise. We pray this in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please stand and worship with me?